Hello, everyone. How are you? Excellent. I'm going to ask you some questions to start. So how many of you are experts in containers? Uh, he is. All right, I have one guy that can back me up if I have questions. Um, how many of you have ever had a hex put on you? A curse. Have you ever had a curse put on you? Do you know what a curse is? Like when a witch, like, like somebody, you do something bad to someone and then the witch puts some kind of curse on you and then you have bad luck for a long time. I'm hoping that during this talk, since it is made out of a lot of demo, it will not have bad luck because last week I had a lot of bad luck in Greece and I think somebody put a curse on me. So if anybody knows how to remove a curse after this, I need to talk to you. <laughs> All right, so um, on a serious note though, how many of you have used Docker before? Good. How many of you have used Podman? That's very good. How many of you have used Cryo? Okay, less. How many, about, how many have used Containerd? All right, so less. How about just Kubernetes in general? Okay, good. So we have a pretty good, this is good. Now, how many of you feel like there's magical black box stuff happening in the container engine? <laughs> I will dispel this. After this, you will realize how not complicated this is. Or how maybe complicated and not complicated is at the same time. It's actually quite complicated in certain ways, but then not in other ways. So I'm going to start with this talk by doing three things. We're going to have some drawings to set up the demo. Then I'm going to run the demo. And then I'm going to ask you some trick questions and see if you can answer the question. So hopefully everyone is ready for participation. Raise your hand if you are ready for participation. OK, good, we have enough. All right, so I remember this, this question comes up to me all the time, right? What does a container engine do? Um, and it comes up through all kinds of weird questions that people ask me that show that they don't, that it's black box to them. They don't understand what's happening. They'll ask me things like, uh, Cryo hasn't been around that long. How's the performance on it? And that's a weird question because even, even that question doesn't completely make sense in that context. Uh, it could if they asked it right, but just a general question like that doesn't actually make sense. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of weird questions around these things. But at a high level, all a container engine does is provide a user interface, whether that's a command line or an API like Cryo or Containerd that is used by another robot like the kubelet, or a human interface like, like Podman or Docker, where it's just a CLI. The other thing it does is mount storage. A lot of people don't realize it kind of handles the meta operations of getting the storage set up. The, the kernel does all the actual storage work, but it's the thing that invokes it in an easy way. Um, thirdly, it creates a config file for run C. How many of you know what run C is? Not that many, I'm surprised. Okay, so it is a black box. It's definitely a black box. So <laughs> you will learn what run C does in this talk. Um, so let's get right into the first demo. And this is the one where I trick you first. Um, the, the, does everyone understand basic processes in Linux? I guess, raise your hand if you understand processes. Okay, that's good. I think everybody feels pretty comfortable with that. So in a nutshell, you could think of it this way. There's a user interface, which is just a CLI. The user types a command in bash. Bash does a fork or exec, depending on what command you're running. And then it talks to the Linux kernel, fire off another process. This is very simple, basic Unix Linux 101. If you look at the way a container engine works, especially something like Podman, it really does something very similar, right? So, and this is a simplified version. I'm going to get much more complicated. Um, but in a nutshell, the user talks to Podman. You can almost think of Podman like Bash. It's really just a utility that then goes and talks to run C, which then does a clone syscall instead of a fork or exec, but it's really very much like a fork, except that it, is, it, is, it has some special options that you pass to it to basically tell it what, what, you, what namespaces to use in the kernel. And then it talks to the kernel to fire off a process. We just happen to call this process a container, but it's really just a process. OK, so looking at them side by side, it's pretty similar. Um, and I'm, I'm going to now do the first demo where I kind of show you what this looks like with a couple different container engines. So this is a Fedora 30 box that I have uh, that I have not upgraded to Fedora 31 because I want to show you how this works on with just run C. Um, how many of you are using Fedora 31? 
Okay, so some of you, how many of you are using containers on Fedora 31? Do you, you do know that you're using C run, right? Okay, good. <laughs> a different uh, container runtime than run C. It is written in C by Giuseppe, who is here, who is actually, I was just in his talk. Okay, so I'm using Fedora 30, though, because I want to kind of use standard technologies that we've been using for a long time and then kind of show how this works. So to demonstrate, I'm going to fire up uh, a few containers with Docker side by side with Podman. So let's do this, uh, bash two, and then let's run bash two. So I want to explain what this is. I created a special container image that I linked bash two to bash. And the only reason I did this was to simplify the process table, as you'll see. So let me run this, and then I'll show you why. So I run this one. Um, this ID just means interactive, but run it as a daemon, basically, in the background. So what this does is this gives me the ability to run two, three of them, whatever. So now let's do the same thing with Podman. So let's run ID, localhost. I've created the same image for, for Podman as I have in the Docker storage for, for the container images that Docker has and the container image storage that, that Podman has. So they look identical. Um, now we'll fire up a couple of these guys, or three, and then we'll do a PS. And we're going to do a PSEF with a capital Z so that we can see the SE Linux contexts. And then we're going to grep for bash 2. You sh this should become clear why I did this now with bash 2. I just wanted something very simple that I could grep for in the process table. So the first trick question here is which one of these was started with Docker and which one was started with Podman? Actually, raise your hand if you think you can tell the difference. Okay, we have one. Anybody else? That a hand? <laughs> Let's go for it. How could you tell the difference? Okay, uh, you're on to something, I'll say that. Let's do this. So yeah, you're seeing the parent-child relationship between the Docker daemon there. So you can see these three ones. Um, whereas, and we'll dig into this deeper, you'll see that these three are actually, their parents is Kanban. Um, so yeah, that's a good way. But, but, from, but once they're running as a process like this, just looking at the process table, can you tell how? Say that one more time. Okay, good. How, how could you tell? What, what about that do you think would give that away? Uh, well, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no. Be, no, because they actually use the exact same library. They actually both use the SE Linux library from containers, the containers repository on GitHub. Actually, Docker, Daemon, and Podman both use the exact same code, <laughs> which I have, I have sifted through to understand all this. Um, so yeah, if you look at this, they're actually just randomly generated contexts, and they're generated by the exact same code. They could be different versions, possibly, you know, depending on when the Go binary was compiled. But I, I don't think that code's changed much in the last five years, so I, don't, I think it's pretty much identical. Um, the point of this is, you can clearly see that these are just processes, right? There is no difference. You can't actually reverse engineer without looking at the process tree, uh, without kind of looking at the parent-child relationship. There's no way to tell. Technology-wise, the exact same technologies in the Linux kernel have been turned on and are running with these processes. And it's pretty much, it's impossible to tell from that alone. Okay, now I want to do another demo. I want to do the same thing, but I want to do it here as a non-root user. Does everyone notice here I had the hash, so I was, I was root when I did this. This is a common thing, it's bad. But now I'm going to do it as non-root. So let's do the same thing. So let's do localhost. Oops, yeah, I gotta do a run. So let's run a couple here as this. And actually, let's go over here and do a and then do an rm-a on this so we get rid of these root running ones. <laughs> 
kill these guys too. Just so that we don't have uh, these polluting our uh, what we're looking at. All right. All right. So now we've ran a couple as Podman. Let's run a couple as Docker. All right. And we'll do three, that's good enough. All right, so now let's do a ps-efz grep for bash two. Now you'll notice that you might be able to tell them apart. Um, does anyone, can anyone see what the difference is? Yeah. The fact that Podman runs like bash means it has a parent-child relationship and it basically runs the process as that user. And so using user namespaces, we're actually running essentially all of the processes in these containers as that user's privilege. Whereas when I ran it with Docker, but, but you might ask, how is this possible? I ran it as a user. I've had people say this to me. They're like, I run Docker as a user, so it's fine. Does that become quickly clear why that's not fine? You're still running, you're essentially giving the user root access when you give them, if you add the user to the Docker group, which gives them the ability to execute the Docker CLI. They now have root on, the, on, on your system, essentially. And I actually do a demo where I'll run one command and become root and change some stuff and muck with the file system. And actually, Dan Walsh does some demos where he shows it's actually worse than just you can become root. It's an untrackable root. You can't even tell who sudoed to it. The uh, login ID is not preserved. And you essentially are a completely uh, anonymous user running things as root. So it's a really bad scenario. But the interesting thing here is really actually that you can tell the difference now. Because if you run them rootless, uh, you're actually running as a regular user. But you'll notice the same thing is happening with the SE Linux context and the labels are getting generated the same. So the same technology is basically being used to isolate these containers. All right, so let's go to the, the, the next one. I already asked you this, I asked you this, uh, this trick question. And I like your process ID tree answer. I like that one the best. So let's do, let's start with like the three things I talked about. So creating a container is different than starting a container. Um, creating a container is really about, actually, sorry, I gotta show you one more slide. Um, I'm gonna kinda use this set of drawings to explain and set up the demo as I do it. And I'm gonna use Podman because Podman has a lot more granularity in its ability to kind, of, to kind of show you what pieces of technology are being used and like what is getting generated and how things are happening. Whereas Docker just kind of does it all in one shot, you can actually break it down as sort of separate steps with Podman. And a lot of these commands are probably obscure and most people don't know them, but I find them very entertaining for showing how things work. So in this, in this drawing, what I'm showing here is that Podman is basically creating a container. And by create, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run the command and show you what happens. It, here, what we're assuming is, is that there's a container image already cached locally in the data storage, in the storage for varlib containers. This is, this is the set of cached container image layers that are local. And then we're also going to, container storage doesn't just store the images, it actually also stores metadata. So that's what that MD is. So when you first create the container, what we're gonna have is a container image locally, and the metadata that d would describe a running container, but nothing else. So here, let me show you. Oops, so let's go back to this user. So podman create-id, let's do this, and then let's do ubi8 and bash. Actually, let's do a more complex one. Let's do dash v slash mnt colon slash mnt. All right, so again, we're, we're creating a container. We're running it interactive so that it'll have a terminal, basically. But it will be disconnected, uh, detached, so that I won't, I won't have it connected to the terminal here. But it'll have a terminal in the container. Um, and then I'm going to do what's called bind mounting of volume. So it's going to become very crystal clear in the next three or four demos what all's happening here. But let's run this command and then see what happens. Okay, so we get back this long string. It's, it's, it's nothing more than a piece of metadata that represents a user space, essentially identity for that container that we will fire up, but isn't fired up yet. So let's do this, podman ps, oh, we still have those other ones. 
let's redo this. Let's do podman kill dash a, podman rm dash a, and then let's do this command one more time. Okay, so now podman ps. There's no container running, right? There's just the metadata representation of a container, which means there's an image pulled locally, and then there is a metadata representation, just that string and some other stuff. But I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So podman has this cool command called L, dash L, I should say, command line option. You can just run the last, the last container image that was, or the last container that was run. So we'll do dash Q, dash, dash, no truncate. This is just gonna give us back that string. So now let's do this. Let's do a find on slash var lib slash containers. This is where Podman stores everything. Um, and then let's grep for, let's grep for that, that ID. Hopefully I'm not using too much bash foo here. Oops, uh, what did I do? Hmm. Oh, that's right, I'm not root. Darn it, that's, uh, I should do this as root. Let's do this as root. Let's do this same thing as root. I like to do these without scripting them so that they're more fun. All right, so let's run that as root. Now let's do, uh, let's do our grep again. Does everyone understand? I'm, I, was an, I was a user, so I, I don't have actual rights to go look at uh, varlib containers. It's actually all happening in, in, the, in the user's home directory. All right, so I've created a container as root. The metadata representation is there. You'll see that some directories have been created under varlib container storage overlay containers. Um, you'll see that there's a user data directory, an artifacts directory, and this SHM directory. But there's nothing else. There's no, there's no mounted storage. There's no config file that gets handed to run C, which I'll show you how that works. Um, there's nothing else uh, yet. But at least what happens here is there is a piece of metadata that knows when I start this, I've already kind of saved that it's gonna fire up that process bash, right? So now, Let's look at the next uh, step. So the story with storage, right? So Podman has this really cool feature that we can actually construct this container little by little. We created the metadata representation. Now we're gonna cause that copy on write uh, piece to, to come into existence. Does everyone understand? Look at this. This container image is three layers. I'm showing a container image here that is three layers. And then for, for a point of example, I'm showing what happens when I actually mount this storage is it adds one more layer on top of that container image, but that, that layer is copy on write. So it, every time I write into that writable directory, it will compare with all the layers in the container image, and if something's different, it'll write a new piece of data on that upper layer. That's all that happens. That's the difference between, between a running container and a not running container. And this might become more clear because I'm gonna build it up and then I'm gonna tear it back down and show you how I tear these pieces apart and then I think it might, I saw some, some puzzled looks but I think this will make sense. So let's run the command. Uh, so we'll do a podman mount on this container we just created. So we'll use this tag here. This command will basically take the data representation of that container image, the mount point that's in a mount namespace and expose it to the root user. So what I get back here is a directory. It's essentially mounted the storage that is in that mount namespace. So now let's, let's do that same find. Uh, actually, no, sorry. You'll, you'll see here it's, it's actually a different ID. This mount is actually a different ID than the container itself. But let's go into this directory so you can see, so you can see what's there. You'll notice that this looks just like a virtual machine, right? This looks like if you exec into a, into a container, if you were to use the exec command or if you were to run bash inside of a container. Um, now we're gonna do some funky stuff though. You do remember that I created the bind mount, right? So you would think maybe this bind mount, MNT should have something in it, right? Like this should be the local MNT. Well, let's touch a file and you'll see this later. Um, and then let's get out of here. Let's go back to my, to my root home directory. Okay, so now let's move on to the next step. Does everyone understand now? We have the metadata created that represents the container. We have a copy on write layer now mounted and ready to go. And, and we also have a persistent volume somewhere out there dangling that we're not quite sure what's going on with it yet. 
Um, this, is the, this is where I ask the question, I ask some more trick questions. How do you think that a container engine can affect the performance of the storage? Actually, let me, let me, let me ask the simpler question. Do you believe that the container engine can have a profound effect on the storage? Raise your hand if you think it can. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the best response. Um, the engine itself doesn't do anything. All right, so, and, and I'll, I'll highlight something very important here. This is the fundamental difference between like traditional software and operating systems, system software and operating systems, and cloud. That meta operation of mounting and unmounting soft, you know, essentially overlay FS layers, that's essentially what we're doing. That's really more, probably more controlled by the kernel than it is by Podman. But Podman could have some effect on the mounting and unmounting. So if you ask the question, could Podman have an effect if you tried to start a thousand containers at the same time? Yes, the answer is yes, because you would be doing a ton of metadata operations, mounting and unmounting, you know, essentially overlay layers. But some of that would come from the kernel's ability to basically mount and unmount that. So now we can ask that question. Now, the runtime performance, though, once it's running, has nothing to do with the container engine, which, which we'll get into in the next thing. Is that crystal clear to everyone? Only the mounting and unmounting has anything to do with the container engine. There's nothing else that it does. All right, so we have a mount point. We have the metadata that represents the container uh, in Podman's basically you know, storage area. Um, and now the next thing we do is we create the config file. So you'll see I have metadata plus C, which means config. So now we're starting to get closer to a container. But Podman has this cool command where we can actually just cause this to be created. So let's go over here, and uh, I showed you that find command. You'll notice that there is no config file in this storage yet. There's only that user data, and that's it. But let's do this. Podman ps, podman ps-a, I forgot to show you this. You'll see this is still sitting in the created status. It's not, it's not running yet. But let's do this, podman init. How many of you are familiar with the podman init command? Raise your hand. Nobody. Okay, this is a cool feature that Matt Heon added. Um, what I just did was cause Podman to go generate the config file that it's going to hand off to run C. Now, let's go look at that config file. You'll see a few things got created, but this is the most important one. Um, let's cat this guy, and then uh, jq. Dot. Dan mentioned in his talk, how many of you were in Dan's talk, the security talk? He mentioned this config file. I don't know if you caught that. But he mentioned that this config file, it's kind of nasty, right? It's got a bunch of sec comp rules in it. It's got, uh, well, it's very long here, so let's go back. I, I piped it into a command called jq just to make it pretty so we could look at it. But you'll see, once I get to the top of this thing, okay, now we're starting to see stuff that looks like what describes a container, right? Uh, we're seeing the OOM killer stuff. We're seeing some labels or annotations. We're seeing things like uh, different options. We're seeing the bind mount. You notice the bind mount, uh, or there are some already pre-existing bind mounts, like the host file, the resolve file, run secrets, run secrets here. Uh, and then you'll see here's some options for terminal things. Um, here's our bind mount. Here's the one that we added. The, when we did the dash V, so now Podman has generated a config file that says, hey, bind mount MNT on MNT. Bind mount slash MNT on the host into the container. Um, and you'll see all kinds of things. You'll even see things like um, sysfs, and then you'll see uh, at the top, you'll see things like what command it ran. Um, it'll even say things like, sometimes it'll say Linux, depending on which container image you pulled and what metadata is in the container image. And I'm gonna show you, that config file is actually very complex. It's actually, I don't wanna walk you through all of this, I do this in a deeper talk, but that config.json that I just showed you is actually the culmination of three things. It's the culmination of things that the image builder put in the container image that you pulled. That's sort of the first thing. Like the default command that that image builder embeds in there, like if you put bash in there and that's the default thing that runs, that is kind of the baseline set of config options that get passed in there. The next thing is the user can override things. You saw I did the dash V, the bind mount. So I added the bind mount. Then the engine added all those, for example, sec comp rules. You saw that long list of sec comp rules. 
the SE Linux SVIRT stuff is all added by the container engine. So it's a culmination of things that the builder, the, the image user wanted the image consumer to basically have certain set defaults, the things that the actual person running the container wanted, and then things that the container engine wanted or was set up to do by default. So that's kind of how that config gets built. Let, let's ask the nasty question. Do you think you can create this configuration by hand? You can. <laughs> yes, would you? That is the question. You see, the container engine basically makes my life, our lives, much easier because it goes and it knows, it is building that config.json file based on the OCI specification for what that config file should look like. Uh, I don't go deep into it in this talk, but that, that, that config file is governed by uh, a specification and then run C, the container runtime that that file gets passed to, uh, the, that's the only option that you pass to run C is that config file. So things like CATA containers and uh, GVisor and run C and C run in Fedora 31, all of these OCI compliant runtimes know how to consume this OCI compliant config file that Podman built. This OCI compliant config file is also almost identical to what Docker would build or what Cryo would build or what any other container engine on the planet would build. So I'm showing kind of this is kind of what the modern day container looks like. It's that config file that's kind of the magic. All right, so now we hand off, we have, we have, uh, we, you know, I, like I mentioned, we have the metadata, we have the config file, we have the copy and write layer, we have the over, we have the bunch of layers that are mapped into the file system from the container image. We have persistent data, kind of, um, which I'm gonna delve into a little bit. And now we're gonna actually hand the, all this off to run C. So, you might think that it's actually, I showed you a simplified version and I lied to you. What actually happens is Podman talks to something called Container Manager, Conmon. Conmon does what is called a double fork. It, dis it runs two forks in a row, disconnects itself from Podman, uh, allows itself to, and then calls uh, forks, or uh, run C, and then actually that calls a clone system call to the Linux kernel to then create the container. And then what we are left with is, let's show you this. Um, so now, let's do a podman ps-ef. Oops, podman, sorry. Podman ps-a. So we have this container. It's still in the created state. There's a config file. Now let's actually run it. Podman start. And we'll tell this thing to start. Okay, now let's do a podman PS dash A, or actually we don't have to do a dash A anymore. Uh, you see it was created 11 minutes ago, but it's only up for five seconds. Um, we now have, you know, we, metadata's there, so there's nothing magical, but the process is running. So let's take a look at PS tree. And then let's try to find this guy. Um, so here it is. You'll notice system D is the, you know, first process that fires up when a, when, when a system boots, when a RHEL or, or Fedora system boots, then you'll, you'll notice that Kanman is, has the parent of systemd, and then bash is the child of Kanman. So let's show you in a drawing. So you, you see, it, this is the process of how it starts, but then once it's running, this is actually what it looks like. Um, it's just the container, its parent Kanman, and then its parent systemd. Now all of this other stuff is still in place, right? Podman is managing the config file, the metadata, the copy and write layers. It's making sure that that stuff's there or not there. This is kind of the definition of whether a container's running or not. Now, let's see something. Uh, let's exec into that running container. Podman, PS, and then let's do Podman exec. Does everyone understand? An exec is going to run, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna run another process in the same namespaces as that existing container. That's basically what we're doing. We're basically firing up another process inside of there. So I'm gonna give it the ID, and then I'm gonna tell it to run bash, and then we're gonna get a shell back. Now we're in the container. Actually, before I do that, I think I may have forgotten to delete something. Um, no, good, I didn't, all right. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Uh, let's get back in there. Okay, let's go into MNT. Oh, I can't get in there. It's because I did not use the capital Z option 
And so that container has a different SE Linux context or label than the MNT file system, you know, the MNT directory in the underlying host. So if I wanted to actually be able to get in there and look, I would actually have to do something slightly different. So let's, let's actually, uh, let's do this again. Let's kill this guy and uh, let's do a podman rm, rm-a, sorry. Now let's run it, or let's do another create. Now let's, let's add this dash z option. And now let's do a mount, actually podman, do this quickly, podman mount. Let's go look at that directory. Let's do our little trick again, where I go into mnt touch uh, test file. And then let's go back, now let's do a podman ps, show you it's there, it's still created, but now let's do a podman run, or, or start. I don't have to do the init because the init will actually happen automatically if I start it. So in this case, it just created the config file and fired up the process at the same time. Um, now let's exec into this. Podman exec shy t. Oops, got to give it a command. We're here. Now let's go into mnt. There's no test file. So what does that mean? Does it, who's brave enough to answer this? No, it's not copy on write. No, in fact, it's not. Um, but it is lazily, uh, it is lazily mounted when you run the container. So it actually isn't mounted yet. So I basically just wrote garbage data there. That test file is gone, basically. It's mounted over, basically, as soon as I start the container. So if I were to, there's no way to actually get to it now. It's gone pretty much forever. Um, uh, actually, I haven't tried if there's a way to hack. There might be a way to hackily get back to it, but it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, but that, I want you to understand that, that that MNT is very different than that copy on write layer. That's actually what I was trying to point out. It's a very different thing. It has native write speed. So an anecdote that I like to talk about with this one was I had a person at a conference a few years ago come up to me and say, we're building Yocto Linux in containers, and it's super slow. And I said, are you using a bind mount? And they said, no. They're like, why would we do that? We don't care about it. It's ephemeral data. And I'm like, this has nothing to do whether it's ephemeral data. Compiling a Linux distribution, which is essentially what compiling Yocto is, immediately what went through my, my architect brain was compiling a Linux distro sounds like a lot of file system operations, right? Like it is building a, a root file system, setting all kinds of labels, permissions, um, user, you know, read maybe changing users, I don't know what all it does, but it makes a ton of metadata operations. If you're doing all that in a copy on write file system, that's going to be very, very slow. Whereas if you do it in a bind mount, it's going to be native speed. It will be just like compiling if we were compiling it not in a container. So understanding the difference between the bind mount and the overlay mount is really important when you start to think about performance. Because Dan mentioned it, if you have MariaDB or, or MySQL and it's bind mounted into the, you know, under that bind mount, the performance is going to be native speed. It's going to be whether that's an NFS share, okay, it might be as slow as an NFS share, or a, or a, or a you know, block device that's mounted that's over you know, a fiber channel network or something like that. But if it's local disk, it's going to be a local disk. But now, you're now back to basic operating system principles with that bind mount. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so now what we have, we have this running container, right? But I think, okay, let's ask some more trick questions. So could we run a Windows container here? Raise your hand if you think we could. Well, just with what I showed you, could we do it? Good, good. There were some people that were quiet, though. It scares me. I think you might have thought it was possible but I'll let you go. Um, this is not possible because run C, as you see, all it does is it takes, this, it takes this config file that Podman built for it, or Docker, or ContainerD, or any other container engine, Cryo. Uh, takes that, all it does is take that as an option and run a process. So unless there's, I mean, possibly with Kimu, possibly with CATA containers, you could do that with CATA containers, maybe. There's ways that you could do it if you fired up a VM. But, but with just basic containers, that is not possible, right? These are Linux processes is all they are. All right, so now the fun part where I start to pick apart the CLI of Docker, which we basically copied with Podman, but it has some confusing things. So let's kill the container and then see what happens. <laughs> 
So podman ps. So, oh, podman. Oh, I'm in the mount. Sorry. Yeah, let me get out here. So podman ps. All right. So now what happens when we kill this? Let's do a podman kill. Who, who thinks they know what happened here? Raise your hand if you think you can describe what I just did. Say that one more time. The process has been killed. That's one part. What else has happened? No, the copy on the right layer has not been deleted yet. That's actually the magic. But yes, the process has been killed. To be honest with you, I'm not sure if the bind mount's gone completely. I don't know if Dan even knows that. Is it gone? I think it is. Um, but, but most importantly, the overlay file system is still there. That copy on right layer is absolutely still there. It's not gone. So when we do a podman ps uh, dash a, you'll see that container is still there. It's just in an exited status. But what that really means is that copy on right layer is still there. I could use it. I could save it as a new image. Uh, it's, it, it looks like this. So, so you'll see, still we have the metadata. That's when I do a ps-a, I can dump the content, see the metadata. I could, the config file is still there, so I could fire it back up if I want. Uh, I, the copy on right layer is still there, and the persistent volume is in La La Land. Like, we can't get to it. It's, it's probably unmounted, but it's irrelevant. Um, because you can't use it because there's no processes running. But then, now what happens when we go to, now what's the next thing we can do? We can do a podman rm, and we start to, we start to deconstruct it, right? Now what does it look like? Well now, or you'll see it's gone. The metadata's gone, the config file's gone, everything in varlib storage is gone. Um, and you start to see, OK, now, now I couldn't turn that old container into a new container image because that copy on right layer is gone. So now it looks like this. Notice here, I have the copy on right layer, I have the metadata, I have the config. Here, I have nothing. Var, you know, container storage is empty, doesn't have anything. The container, that copy on right layer is gone. The persistent volume is basically gone. But, but the data is still there on disk. So obviously, it doesn't delete. Like Anything I put in MNT is still there. So if I would have write, wrote a test file to MNT and it was bind mount on the host, it would be left on the host, right? Uh, and that's actually the magic of bind mount. Now, uh, what happens when we do an RM I? Or, you know, so, so now you'll see if we do a podman images, if we do like podman, just do RMI on this guy. You know, actually, this one is fine. Now it's gone, gone, right? Like, like it's, it's every, all the copy on right layers are gone. So now it looks like this. There's just a container storage is still there. It's empty. That persistent volume is still there. System D is still there. But there's nothing. The, all those copy on right layers are gone now. All the copy on right layers that had been mirrored down from that container image being stored locally are gone. And even the read-only ones that were basically part of that container image. So does that... I'll close with basically the fact that container engines are both more and less complex than you think. There is actually this long string of events happening where podman's calling conman, conman's calling run C, run C's talking to the Linux troll to fire up containers, and I do this spiel a lot of the time when I talk about how that works. But in reality, the things that the container engine are doing are not that complex. It's creating a config file, it's mounting, it's telling the kernel to mount storage, it's not even doing it itself. And then it is, you know, just basically handing that off to run C. Uh, and run C does all the heavy lifting of the, of the interface between the kernel and, and, and basically that entire config file. So the question, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with a little bit of further reading, but I'll say, so now we can answer questions like, I, I'll, I'll give an example of a question that somebody said to me uh, on a webinar I did like a month ago. They said, is cryo mature enough? Like, how do you feel about it? Is it mature enough? And, and I'm like, it doesn't, yeah, I'm 100% confident in it because it creates a config file, it mounts some storage, and then it, it basically hands everything off to the Linux kernel. And so we've been running these exact same types of containers with the exact same technology, with the exact same SE Linux libraries, the S, you know, setconf, run C, all of this stuff. It, it's all been running exactly the same for years now, five, ten, seven, six, seven years now. So yet yeah, what is there to not be confident in, in its maturity? Does that make sense now? 
Like, there's not much that the container engine's actually doing. So I get these weird questions that don't make sense because people just don't have a warm and fuzzy feeling of, in their stomach of how this works. They don't have a gut understanding of how it works, so they ask weird questions that don't quite make sense. So I'll leave you with, whenever you have performance or security questions, you should now be able to kind of reverse engineer from this understanding and kind of answer the question with a lot more confidence. Things like, should I compile Yocto Linux in an ephemeral overlay mount FS? Probably not, because it's writing tons of file system operations. That should now be crystal clear. Things like, how does the performance, uh, how's the performance of cryo versus you know, container D? I mean, there's some metadata operations that there might be differences, but that's it. You know, the running containers are identical. Um, storage, network, same, same exact thing. You know, the, these are all the exact, you can answer the question with storage or with network without even knowing it. I haven't even showed you how it works, but it basically works the same way. Um, No, it doesn't have a daemon. It uses the met So let me repeat the question. So how, I, I think the question is essentially, uh, Docker historically had, Docker is a daemon, and so it can control all the storage basically in place. Like, like everybody has to talk through that daemon. So basically it should basically be the bottleneck, the governor for all of that metadata. Well, it's the same thing. I mean, it's file locks and, and, and Podman, you know, 20 different people. Well, here's a, here's a couple of answers to your question. Um, how does Podman manage that? Well, when you're root, you know, it's basically everybody's accessing var, you know, varlib's container storage, basically. Um, I don't know if there's file locks, Dan. Is I assume there are file locks. We use this advanced feature I developed called the file system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so it's that simple. Does that make sense? It's file system. It's basic file system operations. File systems in general are, are atomic in nature. They know how to do atomic transactions. So you rely on the file system to do it, basically. I do show that in a, in a slide. Uh, I don't have it in this deck, but like, I do show a slide where people don't realize, but that file system driver and the block driver are shared between all the containers, right? If you, if you, if you bind mount stuff and it's on an NFS share, you bind mount something and it's on a block, it's on a, you know, a, a fiber channel, you know, iSCSI or, you know, something like that. It uses the same iSCSI driver. Like, everybody shares that iSCSI driver. So this, if it's XFS, if it's, you know, extension 4, the block and file system drivers are all shared. And basically, like Dan said, they know how to handle atomic transactions. So there's no problem there. Now, that said, I'll go a step further and say users have their storage in their home directory. So different users can't see each other's storage. That's something Docker can't do because everybody's storage is there. So if one user creates an image and has passwords in it, which you shouldn't do, but if you did by mistake, all the other users can see that storage because everybody's sharing that storage. Whereas in Podman, if you're running rootless, they all have their own storage. Everybody, it's basic Unix 101. Everybody's storage is in their home directory. It's dot local slash container storage or whatever. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Do you have any nagging performance and security questions? Am I, am I supposed to talk about that? <laughs> right now it is, but we're working on something else that we, that we basically, did we publish that yet? There, it did go out. I wasn't sure if it went out. All right, so it went out, so I could talk about it. But, but in a nutshell, we're working on an API. So, so there's the local Podman CLI API, if you will. That's the human interface, right? It's essentially the Docker API. It's just Podman run, Podman PS, Podman you know, kill, Podman RM, RMI, all those subcommands. That stays the same. I would call that the local API. But then we had this remote API called Varlink. And Varlink was a way of exposing... Uh, an API that could basically control all of these same things, but in a programmatic way, so you could get request response, basically, so that you could run, for example, Podman in a virtual machine, but have a command uh, locally on a Mac, for example, or locally on a Windows machine, or even locally on another Linux machine, and then have Podman running inside of a VM. Uh, but we're actually 
working on, and we just announced that there's actually a 2.0 version of essentially of this API, and it's actually going to implement the Docker API. So we're going to have an API. Uh, we're going to use System D, I think, right, to basically socket activate it or, or, or network activate it, and then basically have it talk. So th the magic here, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Is you can run the Docker command and talk to Podman. Like the Docker command wants to talk to a remote API that is Docker compliant, and we're actually building an, a an API, a remote API that will be, you know. Docker Compose, Docker Command can talk to it. Um, and then we go fire off a process for Podman in the background, do everything I basically showed you. That's kind of the answer to that. So Varlink goes away. <laughs> but something very cool comes and replaces it. So I can stop asking the question, can I use Docker Compose? I can just say yes. People will be able to use Docker Compose with Podman. <laughs> Any other questions? Any weird questions like Yocto Linux in a container? I love those weird ones. No? Going once? Can I get for a platform? We're close, right? I think it's in the, it's in the, uh, I forget what stages of, yeah, there's a different stage. Uh, if you're a Debian user, we will have Podman soon in Debian. Uh, it's in like a, the testing-ish phase of whatever they call theirs. Yeah, new, right? Yeah, but we had one more. Yeah. I think you might be right, but I don't know. I, I haven't tried that, but I think you might be right. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I just didn't have time to, I just thought about it as I was giving this and was like, wait a minute, how would I do that? Because running something like mount inside of a container is strange. Yeah, but yeah, I think you're right. I think that would work. All right, I think I'm going to cut everyone go. So thank you.